Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. Half-Life 2 has just turned 20 years old. It's pretty crazy to think that 2004, that was 20 years ago. Time really flies. I remember playing this game back when I was a kid. It was a great game, totally revolutionary for the time. To celebrate the 20th year anniversary, Valve has put out a free update with a bunch of nice goodies, as well as a really excellent two-hour documentary. By the way, I first wrote about this story in my Game Dev Report newsletter. That's my weekly newsletter where I cover the latest Game Dev news and any interesting articles that I come across. So in there, I cover this nice Half-Life 2 turns 20 story. I covered some very important tips for making a great Steam demo. I wrote about an excellent free Unity 6 URP ebook. Also about a fun trend that happened a while ago about people posting their progress GIFs. And a bunch more interesting stories. This is a free, easy to read weekly newsletter. Check it out with the link in the description. Okay, so Half-Life 2 turned 20 and they updated the game. By the way, it's currently pretty much free on Steam. So if you don't have it, then I highly recommend you get it. This is a great game, it's a very significant game. So even if you're not a fan of genre, I recommend you play through it just because of the historical significance. Alongside the update, they've published a really excellent two-hour documentary. I really loved watching the whole thing, I highly recommend you give it a watch. So here are five interesting lessons that I took away from the documentary. And then I'll also talk about some funny things. And of course, what exactly happened with Half-Life 3. So the first lesson is a really interesting one all about AI, all about how the illusion of intelligence is actually the best kind of AI. They talk about two very interesting scenarios. So one is where the player goes inside a building directly onto the second floor. The player approaches an ammo crate, and as they approach right next to the window, yep, there you go, a bunch of enemies start shooting the window. And secondly is when the player is on a lighthouse. On this one, as the player is going up the stairs, yep, there you go, the helicopter also shoots through the windows. Now this makes it seem like the AI is actually super smart. It makes it seem like the AI is super clever and is actually predicting where the player will go to. However, in reality, they just implemented what they call a bullseye mechanic. Basically, they just set the component directly on the windows. And when the AI checks for a nearby target that has that component attached, when they do, they prioritize that target above anything else. So as the player goes near the window, it enables those targets and the AI just shoots at them. They're really just invisible targets. So it seems like the AI is predicting where exactly the player is going to, but the whole thing is really just smoke and mirrors. They also mention one very crucial thing that you have to keep in mind when it comes to AI. What makes AI fights interesting is not that they're the smartest or the best or anything. Like, it's easy to make AI that can just perfectly shoot the player and kill them. That's not what makes them smart. It's putting on a show that makes them feel interesting. Remember how your goal as a developer is not to make a super intelligent AI? It's actually very easy to make an AI with perfect tactics, perfect aim, something that never misses. That is very, very easy to do, but that is also very terrible AI. It is not fun to play against that at all. Instead, your goal as a developer is to make compelling AI, make something that is fun to play against. Sometimes it means very challenging and actually intelligent, and sometimes it really just means just the appearance of intelligence. Next lesson, remember how different players play the game differently. When talking about the sequence on the canals, they mentioned this very important lesson. In case you haven't played the game, this is a sequence where the player gets access to a vehicle sort of like a hovercraft. It's a vehicle that drives both on water and on land. And here they did some playtests and they realized that players were mostly in just two camps. First, one top player was just going full throttle, just constantly forward, non-stop, just getting to the end of the level. And secondly, another type of player was basically stopping at every single point to check every inch of the entire map. Now as a developer, it's your goal to satisfy basically both of these players. For the people that just speed through everything, for those, you need to make it fun to go super fast and need to give them enough tools, enough challenge just on the vehicle. Also encourage them to slow down for a little bit. The way they did that here was by adding a bunch of puzzles that are required to pass through. And for the other top player, for these you need to ensure that every single inch of the map is filled with something interesting. So they placed a bunch of optional areas. They made them visible by using a nice lambda symbol. And if the player explores those optional areas, they get maybe some nice ammo or a little bit of sneak peek behind the story. Some players absolutely refused to really stay in their airboats. They wanted to get out and look under every rock, behind every tree. On this topic, there's actually a very famous paper. It is called the Barron Taxonomy of Player Types. It's how in general you can categorize players as being within one of these four types. In general, the achievers, these really only want points. Then for the explorers, these really just want to explore the entire world. The socializers, these like to talk to other people or some NPCs. And then the killers, they really just want to attack with everything that moves. So the killers act on other players, the achievers act on the world, the explorers interact with the world, and the socializers interact with other players. Ideally, your game should be a satisfying experience for pretty much any of these kinds of players. But in general, the important lesson is remember how different players play games differently. Look to your own <laughs> salvation. <laughs> Next lesson, don't be afraid to cut what doesn't work. In documentary, they talk about a level on the Borealis. 
This is a very mysterious ship in the Half-Life universe. It also shows up in the Portal storyline. They created the entire level, they set up some NPCs and even set up some AI. They did a ton of work and then importantly did a ton of playtests. And while doing all that playtest, they realized that it really just doesn't work. Mainly because ships are actually really tiny, so it's all super close quarters. They tested and tested and eventually realized they really just couldn't make it work. It was not satisfying to play in such a close quarter environment. Now technically, they could have kept this in the game. The rest of the game would still work, but it would have one level in the middle that was clearly subpar. So in this case, cutting the level was very much the right choice. In your own games, don't be afraid to experiment with all kinds of wacky ideas, wacky levels, items, weapons, and so on. But at the same time, don't be afraid to cut those if they don't serve your main game design pillars. If they just simply don't work, then don't leave them in. It is always better to have a game with slightly less content, but everything is much, much higher quality. That is always much better than having a ton of content, but a lot of it is very subpar. I joined Half-Life 2 probably a year after it had started. Um... I know that it was at least a year because I was put on Borealis, which was like everybody else had disowned. Um, but then I came along and said, oh, well, I guess this is now your problem. Um, so I started on Borealis and of course I failed at that too. <laughs> I eventually got cut. Next lesson, iterate, iterate and iterate. If you watch the entire documentary, then this becomes very clear. They constantly mention iterating upon literally everything. They iterated upon the level design, upon the weapons, upon the art, upon the enemies, upon the story, and literally everything. Dozens and dozens of people come through one section of the game, and you sit there painfully, silently, taking notes while they struggle and get frustrated and totally misunderstand your brilliant design. Um, and then you go and you, you fix that over and over and over again. Always remember that when you play a final game, what you're seeing is actually the final product. It is absolutely not the very first draft. What you see in the end is not the first thing the developers came up with. That's actually the exact same thing that I always say in my tutorials. When you see the code that I write in the tutorials, always remember how what you're seeing over there, that is my code after I've done a ton of research and after I've done a ton of refactoring. What you see in the final video is not my first attempt at building whatever system it is. This concept applies to code and to literally everything else. Another thing they also mention a lot as part of this iteration cycle is simply playtesting. They were constantly building the game, constantly giving the game to other players to play, and then watching the results. Then based on those results, either they kept going in the same direction or they completely switched course. So do not ignore iteration. Don't assume your very first idea is always going to be the best idea. Always iterate upon your designs until you find something that actually truly works. You know, we'd come up with an idea for the helicopter and then we'd be like, okay, let's put it in front of somebody and watch it happen. And then we'd very quickly start realizing that our mental model of like how people are reacting to this stuff is wildly different than what we expected. Next lesson, and this is a super practical one, it's a mechanics interaction grid. This is where you can create a grid of all your items, all your weapons, mechanics, enemies, and so on, and then make sure that there's something interesting at every single one of those intersections. This is a very ingenious idea. I've heard this concept mentioned a few times in a bunch of GTC talks, especially if you're making a game in the immersive sim genre. For that genre, this is an absolutely excellent approach. Just write down all of your mechanics, all of your items, enemies, and so on. Just design that entire grid and then make sure on every single square something interesting happens within those. If you do that, you end up with very interesting emergent gameplay. So that everything has a meaningful interaction with everything else. And where we saw empty cells, we would actually design a thing. Yeah, like, is there something we could do there? Yeah, barnacles plus grenades uh, or whatever, you know. Okay, we need to make sure that they'll eat the grenade and then blow up. So those are five interesting lessons that I took away from this documentary. But then, the documentary actually also had a bunch of funny moments. One great moment is the voice actor for G-Man. He's always over your shoulder, watching, waiting for the moment to speak. It is really impressive to see how he suddenly turns on that very weird voice. It is still to this day one of the most iconic voices in gaming. It is such a strange manner of speaking. The right man in the wrong place can make all the difference in the world. And he also actually talks about why exactly does a G-Man talk like that? And apparently it's how the G-Man works between time, so the whole thing is very glitching. His relationship to time is very different than you or I would think. In my mind, he could literally be in two places at once, and so sometimes there was a kind of a, an implied hitch in his timing, or he's experiencing two or three different moments at once, and that might be funny for a reason that you don't know, because you're only in one time with him at, at a moment. Then all the characters from the entire game, they were basically just random people that they found. 
like literally Eli, one of the most important characters in the game itself. Apparently that was just a random guy that was holding a sign near their headquarters. Then Dr. Kleiner is apparently just an accountant that worked in the office under stairs. Barney was their COO. Kate Johnson was actually one of their animators. So lots of very unique characters. No one's asking you for beers or anything? No, no. no. Or buying me beers. <laughs> <laughs> then another funny moment. In the section where they talk about a pretty serious lawsuit, how apparently they were very close to actually going bankrupt, at some point one of the lawyers actually found an email, and in that email, the other company, they wrote about how they were intentionally destroying evidence. And then and they, they said, well, there's these other emails between these vice presidents where one says something like, hey, we destroyed those Valve documents like you asked. So this really reminds me of that hilarious scene in The Wire. Nigga, is you taking notes on a criminal fucking conspiracy? What the fuck is you thinking, man? Another funny one is a story about a shark trying to bite Gabe and how he was apparently completely unbothered by it. I'm kind of a weird person in a number of dimensions. Like I was diving in South Africa recently and a shark tried to bite me a couple of times. And the people around me were way more freaked out than I was. I was like, oh, a shark's trying to bite me. I should get away from the shark. Whereas other people were having like, oh, a shark, it's trying to bite somebody, you know. Um, and I just think that's how I'm wired. And of course, at the end, they also talk about what happened with Half-Life 3 or Episode 3, specifically why it never came to pass. And funnily enough, the answer is actually the same reason why so many indie devs never publish a game. The answer is really just perfectionism. Basically, Gabe Newell considers it a personal failure that the game was never made. He felt that they could very easily just make another entry to finish the story, but he also felt that just doing that was not going to be enough. He felt that the game needed something special, it needed to innovate in some way. It couldn't just be yet another game with similar mechanics and just a different story. And since they couldn't come up with anything extremely innovative and revolutionary, because that, time went by, they moved on to other projects, and eventually they just felt that it was too late. So this is a really interesting point. I'm sure that some people were indeed waiting for this. There were some people waiting for something super innovative and would not accept anything other than that. But I would guess the majority of people, like myself, would be very very happy with exactly the same gameplay as episode 2, and really just finishing the actual story. They did try to innovate in some ways. They had a very interesting ice gun. It could apparently block shields, it could cause weight, and it could even do some kind of ice surfing. So that seemed like an interesting mechanic. Then they also made a very weird blob enemy. It could split into pieces, go through walls, and do a bunch of weird things. It looks very weird, very strange. So they were definitely trying to do some things, but they just didn't feel it was enough. They also mentioned how the team was simply just a little bit burned out on working on Half-Life. I mean, by this point, they had been working on it for over a decade. So for some people on the team, they left to go work on Left 4 Dead and TF2, Portal, and a bunch more. And then after those games were done, they just felt it was simply too long to get back to Half-Life 3, so they never did it. I would say this whole thing really showcased the problems with perfectionism. It is really awesome to have high standards. I mean, they wouldn't have made multiple masterpieces without those high standards. But at the same time, at some point, you have to be realistic. At some point, it is much better to launch your game. It doesn't have to be perfect to be great. So take that lesson yourself. Do the best you can do with your games, but don't chase absolute perfection. And listen to these other lessons as well. I mean, despite being a documentary for a AAA game, despite that, you can definitely still follow these lessons in your own indie games. And I highly recommend you go watch the full documentary. The whole thing is really excellent. I absolutely loved it. Also, Black Friday is currently live. There's a ton of awesome lessons on sale. I covered my highlights in the previous video. Then the Cinti store also has deep discounts on their gorgeous low poly assets. And there are three humble bundles also with excellent discounts. So if you need anything for your games, then now is a great time to get it. Check out all the sales with the links in the description. Alright, so thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.